Tonight, uh, we are pleased to be uh, broadcasting from the Barnyard Inn and Carriage House in Totowa, New Jersey, 754 Totowa Road. We thank the Barnyard for having us here, as they do often. And by the way, it's a great place to come and eat. Great steaks. You can come before, you can bring your meal into the carriage house for the meeting. And uh, we thank uh, everybody very much for that. Parties.com, and I'm also the state uh, student recruiter from New Jersey. Uh, and this show is a show called Women of Another View. It is a syndicate show on Liberty Action Network TV. And uh, I'd like to welcome to the show our hosts, Barbara from Harlem. Welcome, Susan Jarima, and Patty Rivera. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the issue of education and sustainability, what it means on the campuses, and also what it means in your community. Okay, and um, with us tonight is we have a professor here of sociology, uh, Beta Karmut. He's from Morris County Community College. Welcome. Okay. And. Uh, Also, a gentleman from Carroll County, Maryland, who drove up to be with us tonight. He is one of the first counties to give pushback against Common Core. Okay, and is also, uh, their county is a Second Amendment sanctuary, correct? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And he's also here to talk to you about sustainable development. Uh, and first, let's go to you, Bader. Uh, I want to pose the question, because you're a professor on campuses, and I have also worked on campuses, and I noticed that they have uh, what they call sustainable studies. Uh, what is that? Everybody's like, what is that? Okay, social justice education, transformative education, you name it, all those code words on there. Okay, and... Um, Bader, if you can explain to the folks what is meant by that. Sure. Um, am I, okay. I believe I'm talking about it. Just first to clarify what sustainability is, let me answer it in two ways. One, what the liberals say it is. And two, what we know what it means, how it in application. Sustainability simply means to endure. Um, sounds good. Who doesn't want to endure? but then we'll get into the, uh, into the nitty gritty of it in a minute. But in order to endure, society must transform markets, is what they say. What does that mean? That simply means capitalism is no longer acceptable, and we have to move on to transform markets, move on to socialism, redistribution of wealth. And we also need to uh, change how we produce goods and how we consume goods, according to the liberal left. How we produce goods simply means that we need to change how we manufacture, what we manufacture, and consume what we buy, how much of it we buy, and how much per person should have a right to purchase. So these are ideas that they believe needs to be looked at. They also want to change how we measure value. Value is something that uh, uh, we as a society, for example, we value hard work through hard work, Historically speaking, we've been able to, to uh, uh, purchase property, purchase goods, purchase uh, leisure. Leisure is something we purchase through money. We're able to afford to go on vacation and all of that. But the liberal left wants to change that by identifying money as no longer something that needs to be uh, uh, hoarded by individuals who work for it, but rather something that needs to be redistributed to make sure everyone has it. Now, sustainability is looked at from three, the three aspects, three pillars, is what comes down to environmental, social equity, and economics. 
On the environmental, the, the idea here is to, to get a balance of all three, according to them. The idea here on the environmental, they want to be able to regulate, maintain, whatever it takes to have what they feel is clean, safe water, uh, fresh systems, uh, land, atmosphere. They want to also make sure ecosystems are protected all the way from forests, all the way to your home garden. They want to be able to control and regulate for the sake of environmental protection. Uh, social equity, they want to make sure every person has what they deem to be uh, access to a, a, a livable standard. Every person should have access to shelter, uh, health care, all of that, and economics. They, they do not believe people ought to have more than what they need. Now the question becomes, who makes that determination? How much is what one person needs and who has the right to say? Uh, this is all being done. Uh, uh, in a big scheme of things, which we'll get into details, I assume, in a few minutes. Um, but the idea here is we're handing over our control over to a, uh, a larger entity and we don't have as much say. So that's what the liberal left are teaching, and we'll get in a minute into what it really means. And Commissioner, let's go to you and talk about the K-12 system. And, you know, we've also talked with me about Common Core. Can you explain to everybody what that is and how might that reflect on the collective rather than the individual? Mm -hmm. well, Common Core reminds me of the uh, imagery, the logo for the Fabian Socialists and what Wolf in Sheep's clothing. On the surface, this is benevolent set of national uh, set of standards developed at the governor's level uh, to be adopted voluntarily nationwide with uh, standard requirements, standard assessments. They are going to promote uh, movement of students between states. Some of those arguments are correct. The problem I have with Common Core, though, in this attempt to establish these national standards, are number one, we don't have any empirical evidence that they're even going to approve anything. Number two, one of the premises of Common Core is that creating this quote unquote higher level of standards, assuming we yield them, and there are some governors who would argue that that's not true, but, uh, but the assumption would be that higher level standards will improve performance. But we have letters and articles from the Brookings Institute the Cato Institute specifically rebutting that assumption, stating that there is no correlation across the country between the level of performance versus the level of standards. There are states that have low standards and high performance, and vice versa. But the real problem I have with this is that it amounts to the de facto federalization of education. And they say, oh no, Commissioner, no, no, this is, we're just setting the standards. The, the local the municipalities can still establish their own curriculum. But I raise this question, I would argue that he who establishes the standards and establishes the test drives the curriculum. And I've already seen signs of uh, vernacular slipping in, I see signs of things that trouble me, I look at what's called the reading exemplars, which are sample reading, I see samples uh, that are bent liberally to the left, I see uh, teaching lessons, for lesson plans for teachers that are bent to the left. They look like more out of something from a Sam Alinsky novel, or Rules for Radicals. And, uh, and I also see vernacular slipping in, which is a concern to me. If you Google the words, for those of you that are watching TV, if you Google the terms go Common Core and Social Justice, you will get thousands of hits. And when you look at the definition of Social Justice from the Iowa State University A to Z, Dictionary on sustainability, it's defined as economic egalitarianism achieved through redistribution of wealth or even redistribution of property. I see other words such as global citizen are uh, endemic and throughout Common Core, and I raise the rhetorical question, I don't really want my children trained to be global citizens, I want them trained to be American citizens. So, I want to caution parents out there, don't go and accuse your local the Board of Education of implementing a Marxist uh, doctrine, they're going to use it against you. I use a different set of terms, I accuse them of teaching curriculum in such a way that it is de-Americanizing our children. Uh, our host here, uh, Pat, do you want to ask a question? Well, I do. I, I'd like to know how, how is all of this funded? All of this Common Core education is coming out of the federal government. Is it being funded by us, the American people? Are our tax dollars going to 
re-educate or de-educate our children by reducing the standards that we've come to enjoy? Well, the funding appears to be coming from two places. Uh, the largest uh, non-public source appears to be the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It's funded approximately $160 million. And the federal government, of course, also has its fingers in it. The federal government has funded over $300 million towards creation of the standardized assessments and standardized tests. And I've always said in government that if you want to know who makes the rules, just follow the money. Who has the gold makes the rules. If I'm the federal government and I have billions of dollars, I simply dangle $50 million for Achieve and say, please create this module explaining the benefits of a command economy. For those of you out there that were born before 19 or after 1955, command economy is educrat speak for communism nowadays. And number two, after I create that module, I simply dangle $50 million in front of every state and say, here, create this module to achieve these standards and we'll give you $50 million here. So he who has the goal will make the rules. And I tell people, I don't even care whether or not we can't find anything that's problematic in the curriculum yet. They were shrewd. They started with non-controversial items such as English and math, but the science and the history have yet to come. They understand that they were going to encounter huge political resistance. They've been cautious about what they put in the curriculum. And the standards, although they have slipped in a few places, but make no mistake, the frog is in the water. Just because the water is not boiling doesn't mean that we don't have a problem. In the English, there is, uh, there's already problems beginning to, to become evident. For example, as the commissioner and I were talking earlier, there's a book titled The Bluest Eye. I don't know if anyone is familiar with it. It is nearly a text-rated book that um, describes <coughs> Describes pedophilia. I apologize. Uh, currently, there's still objection to some of the content uh, in the reading material that is approved for readers. A book titled The Bluest Eye. And in that book, you find that there's an objection no more material in there. For example, that book describes pedophilia by detail as if the reader is the uh, a child molester. It describes rape so uh, intimately that the reader is. It feels like they're the rapist uh, in such uh, uh, horrific X-rated uh, uh, language, uh, and that's being on the approved list of, in, in reading. Now, if I may suggest something, uh, I, I want to say this now because I don't know if I'll get an opportunity later. If you have a pen and paper, I'm going to give you a bill number. A bill number. One for the Assembly, one for the Senate. This bill establishes a task force in New Jersey to evaluate Common Core. This bill establishes a task force to evaluate Common Core. Two numbers. One is for the Assembly. It starts with the letter A, 4403. And the other is in the Senate. It starts with the letter S, 2973. Please find out who your Assemblyman and or assembly women, call them, tell them to support, to co-sponsor this bill. Assembly A4403, and then call your senators. Tell them to please co-sponsor and support Senate Bill 2973, and then read them the name, because years over years the, the numbers stay the same, but names change. So read them the name, it is establishes task force to evaluate Common Core. That is so important that I have to inject it here because I don't know if I'll have an opportunity later. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. And let's go to Susan Dreamer. Um, my taxes, how does this affect my local taxes? Common Core or sustainability of both? Both. Okay. Uh, well, sustainability certainly does because what we find Assuming I'm the fact that this one, because this is not working. Um, sustainability certainly does, and for that I have another bill number for you if you want. I'm just full of bills. Um, what, well, because I believe educating is not enough, we also have to motivate people to action. Everyone in this room could be calling an assemblyman and a senator, and when a, if you're sitting in your office as an assemblyman, you get 60 people calling you tomorrow morning, you're going to pay attention. And that, what, why else are we here except to try to become an agent of change for good? Um, 
And sustainability certainly costs taxes, because what they're doing um, is taking money uh, away from home property owners by telling them you cannot use this piece of property as you may have deemed you wanted to use it. Maybe you're no longer allowed to farm because they're afraid your horses will urinate near the river, which happened to a neighbor of mine. A state agent came up on his property and said, do your horses urinate in the water? He's like, I don't know, I assume so. <laughs> they made him build a fence 10 feet away from the water so the horses cannot come anywhere near that water because they were afraid of that. So that's additional expense. Other neighbors I know, and I'm sure the commissioner can speak further on this, um, where people were no longer allowed to use certain properties for commercial purpose and limiting their commercial use by uh, forcing them to, to go through an enormous expenditure. My in-laws are farmers out west, and out west, you know, if you have a large farm, you have to, according to federal law, have uh, a means to, to keep the dust down. Dust is not allowed on the farm anymore, according to federal law. You have to have a machine that sprays water behind your commercial vehicles on a farm to keep the dust down. So all of this uh, uh, costs money not only on the farmer, but if the farmer could no longer maintain that farm or loses it to the bank, that effectuates the uh, uh, taxpayers because everybody else has to make up that difference. So there's so many ways that this could affect taxes and increase property taxes. But I'll let the commissioner have an opportunity to speak on that if he wishes. Well, I'll make a, 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 two comments. One quickly with respect to Common Core. We have the annual cost of testing, which can run $30 per test per child with several tests per year. But the primary issue to concern about the Common Core, of course, is the fact that it adds another layer of shackles or handcuffs on our teachers and restricts their degree of movement to which they can teach different curriculum to different child, uh, different children. And furthermore, I want to point out that these standards will also affect the non-public sector also. If these standards are promulgated nationwide, our private schools, our parochial schools, our home schools will have to convert the material to accommodate this new testing rubric, and will cost them money also. Going on to sustainability, I have some very strong statements about sustainability. We hear things about environmental sustainability, equitable sustainability, but it is an oxymoron because everything that's about sustainability is sustainable except the finances. Every sustainability program I have seen is financially unsustainable. Whether we're talking green energy, green buildings, uh, green buildings, there's no return on investment. And most interestingly is when they talk about sustainable communities where they attempt to gerrymander and socially re-engineer our neighborhoods to, meet, to create compact, walkable communities with housing available to people of all income levels, blah, 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 blah. The problem is we've done studies, we know what it costs to run a county. For example, to use round numbers, in our county, if a house costs $300,000 and produces, let's say, $4,000 in property taxes, and then the house produces another $4,000 in piggyback taxes, that's $8,000. That house can more or less sustain its cost of services. As soon as I do what the federal government and state government want me to do and put a bunch of lower cost housing in there using grants that's sustainable, the property tax revenue drops to a fraction of what it is today, and in many cases, the income from that household will drop to, a, to, the, to zero or 25% of what it is today, and it is not financially sustainable. It will not produce enough revenue to cover the cost of services, police, fire, social services, schools. So the fact of the matter is the more sustainable housing you build under the guise of promoting social equity, the more we will have to raise the taxes on every other member of that community to, to subsidize the cost of providing services to the lower cost houses. I'd like to go to Barbara. Yes, uh, well, I don't have a question, really. Um, just sitting here, all I hear is socialism, socialism, so socialism. Because to me, all of it adds up to the loss of our freedoms, our liberties, and more control over our lives. You know, we have certain unalienable rights that are given to us by God. And it would appear to me that these um, subliminal ways that they're trying to eliminate those rights that are ours because we are creatures created by a creator. So all I hear is socialism. That's right, and I, I want to mention yeah. today, uh, uh, Professor Bader Carver, we were a guest in his class today, and the commissioner did something with the students that was, that was very miraculous. He actually gave students candy when they answered the 
question right. And some students had a lot of candy, and some students didn't have as much. And so he did a little exercise, and he called up some students that had a lot and some that didn't, and he said to them, well, you know, I'm a, a politician, I want to get votes, so therefore I want to take from, from you guys who have a lot of candy, I want to take a package and give it to, to the other half of students who didn't have as much. And when you see the face on those students, then they started to realize, uh-oh, that's right. something wasn't right. Okay. Well, I, I want to make a, a, a more generic comment about that. That was a fun exercise, but <laughs> when children are not taught American values, when they are not taught that, when they first hear the socialist values and environment and economy and social equity, it sounds reasonably good. But it has to be juxtaposed against our constitutional and alienable rights, which Barbara's talking about, of life, liberty, and property. And the key thing to understand about the sustainability movement is this. Our country was founded on the theory that government needed to protect us from tyranny of man against man. That's right. And to do that, we have unalienable rights of life, liberty, and property. They are individual rights. Sustainability seeks to replace those individual rights with collective goals of environment, economy, and social equity. And if our children are not taught to appreciate and cherish their individual unalienable rights through the school system, the first time they hear these socialist concepts, they go, wow, that sounds good. I think I'll adopt them. But when they have a chance to compare the two and see the two in action, as Doreen was saying, all of a sudden, the idea that the good of the many should outweigh the good of the few, if it means that the many could take away their home or their property from them, it doesn't seem so desirable anymore. And they say, on second thought, I'll take my individual rights back. Absolutely. What Barbara from Harlem had said, you know, when we hear sustainability, one word that comes to mind for me is hypocrisy. When we talk um, global warming, whose name comes to the forefront? Al Gore. You would think that man was a Mother Teresa living in a hut in some rainforest. But no. Let me tell you a couple of facts about Al Gore. Um, the average American home is 2,700 square feet. Al Gore's is over 10,000. The average American family uses approximately, and I'm going to look at the numbers so I don't mess this up because I don't want to be inaccurate, uses approximately 10,000 KWs per hour per year of electricity. Approximately 10,000. Al Gore uses 220,000 KW hours per year. Mm -hmm. 20 times the amount of the average American home. And he's the one in hypocritical places that's telling us how we ought to live, how we ought to spend our money, and where we need to be. Um, I, I saw the commissioner's exercise today and I thought it was wonderful. I do something similar to that as well in my class where at the end of the first quiz, the students who get an A's and B's, C's, and D's. And I tell the students who get D's and F's, not to worry, because I'm going to give you a C in this class. They all start loving me. And I said, well, that C's got to come from somewhere. Absolutely. So I hope it's okay with the A's and B's that we borrow a little bit from them. Because you really don't need an A to pass my class. Who really needs an A to pass my class? So let's just borrow a little bit from them. And often they're the ones that are giving up the biggest amount of objection. Hey, I studied, I worked hard for that A. But you don't need an A to pass my class. Ladies and gentlemen, never let anyone say to you, what do you need this for? Because it's often, we heard that when it comes to the Second Amendment. Well, what do you need that kind of gun for? What do you need that large home for is next. Why do you need two cars in the driveway? This is America. If you could afford it, and you rightfully gain that money to purchase it, you should have a right to own it. You should have a right to have it. And unfortunately, what I'm finding is an enormous amount of hypocrisy. They, it's not that they don't want use. They just don't want us to have it, so they can possess it. That's the problem. Dorian, if I add one thing to that. Okay, I'm going to give you two minutes, because we're taking questions. I want to read a quote from C.S. Lewis, which, which helps summarize why they are so difficult to fight. And I call this my de facto rubric of sustainability. C.S. Lewis says, quote, of all tyrannies, a tyranny exercised for the good of its victims may be the most oppressive. It may be better to live under robber barons than under omnipotent moral busybodies. Mm -hmm. The robber baron's cruelty may sometimes sleep. His cupidity at some point may be satiated. But those who torment us for our own good will torment us without end, for they do so with the approval of their own conscience. Absolutely. Thank you.
Thank you, Commissioner. And uh, at this point, I'd like to take some questions from our audience, if I may. Before you do, can I just add one little comment, please? I, 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 when you mentioned hypocrisy, they're talking about, they're so concerned about how we live in the environment, but why aren't they concerned about those babies in the womb? Well, uh, very good, very good. Royal hypocrisy. Very good point. Um, and, right, and also, does anybody have any questions? What we talked about so far? Hold on. Does, does Yes, I, I, my question is, um, the education of, of uh, uh, let's say, uh, high school students, uh, if they come home and watch mainstream uh, TV, which is owned by the communist takeover of our country, is social media able to reach them and start to um, change their educational point of view? What I find from my students, the overwhelming majority of students don't watch any anything really educationally significant on TV. Uh, if anything, uh, they'll watch some silly shows that have no meaning. And if they do watch anything that resembles news, it's going to be the satire news of uh, the, those comedy channels that all they do is make fun of uh, um, politicians and spin the truth around. They don't really teach any, any, anything of any value. But what I have found is the quality of education has diminished immensely. I have here with me a copy of a quiz that they give to eighth graders when they graduate eighth grade. As an exercise in my class, I give it to my college students. I have to tell you, in the years I've been doing this, never one student has ever passed that test. I believe it. And this test was given in the 1880s, 18, between 50s and 90s, 1850s and 1890s. Now, 2013, we're supposed to be the smart generation. We are, the students can do not pass this test. So are we doing this on purpose? Are we dumbing our own society yes. on purpose? So, so. so we could be asleep while the wolves run wild? Is, is that what's happening? You be the judge. Yes. Okay, we do have time for another question. Any, any more? I have a question. Oh, there's somebody here? Over here. Hold on. Get your mic so everybody can hear. What happens when someone like my granddaughter, who's been enlightened by our family, goes to Rutgers University now and gets embroiled in one of these classes, and if she speaks her mind, is she going to be punished with a low grade because the professor is a radical and doesn't want to hear from her? What does someone do who has the right ideas, the right opinions, and is fighting the establishment? Well, this is what I tell, what I, actually what I said earlier in class today. For those who, who deal with currency, if you've ever worked as a cashier anywhere, and you're constantly dealing with money, and someone hands you a fake bill, you're almost immediately able to notice it because you're so used to handling the truth. You know what a lie is. And that's wonderful. If she's able to know the truth, she could, when, when a lie is said to her, she could certainly say, uh, uh, go against it with the truth. So. Uh, yes, I, I also want to mention there's a group called FIRE, Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. Any problems you have like that on the campus, you contact them. It's a group of attorneys are located out of Philadelphia. They, they work with a lot of free speech and they help issues like that on campus. FIRE, it's Foundation for Individual Rights in, educa in Education. Do um, you have any other questions? I, I just had a question, a quick question that people might be interested in. Can you define social equity? Uh, okay. Well, real, real quickly, I, I think that social equity in, its, in, its, in reality is, is an attempt to achieve economic egalitarianism. It, it, it suggests and implies the redistribution of income, the redistribution of property, the redistribution of wealth in general, to try to create a, a common center for all people, whether the rich get poor and the poor, poor get wealthier, at the end the government does. Okay, um, I'd like to thank our viewers for watching us today. For more information on the show, please go to campusteaparties.com. That's campusteaparties.com. And thank you very much.